Hi folks, welcome back. Thank you for watching. Please do hit subscribe if you haven't done so yet. As always, it really does help when you do that. So today, guys, it's the final hurdle. We're going to be mastering the new song. Now, in a very small, oversimplified nutshell, what mastering is, is treating the entire mix to a bit of gentle EQ to balance it out, adding a little bit of subtle enhancement and then bringing it up to commercial volume. Because when we mix, we actually mix quite quiet and mastering or it right up so that the volume of the track is equivalent to the other songs in your iTunes give or take. So I've got my mix in Pro Tools here on this first fader and this is exactly as it's come out of the mix session so that sounds like so. So that's sounding pretty much where I want it to be. I've worked really hard in the mix to get it kind of as polished as I can before mastering. You shouldn't, you're a bit like the whole fix it in the mix mentality. You shouldn't use mastering to kind of, you know, airbrush over things. It should just be refining it and making sure it's comparable with other recordings. It shouldn't be for fixing major problems. So that mix is pretty much where I want it already. But I've added a few things on top here just to kind of enhance it slightly. The first thing I've put on is this EQ here. Now this is an amazing mastering EQ made by PSP. It's called the Master Q2. It's really great and I actually use it as a limiter later on as well. So you can do so many things with it. But all I'm doing in here is very broad brush strokes just to kind of tweak the entire mix to make it sit a bit better. So down here I've got a high pass filter at 21 hertz. Now you can't hear 21 hertz. There shouldn't be anything down there because everything's been high passed on the way in. But just in case there is, that, those frequencies will be sucking loads of energy out of the mix. So getting into the habit of just taking that out in case there's something there is a really good thing to be doing. Then other than that I've added a little bit of a kick in in the sub frequencies at 50 hertz chopped out some low mids just to get rid of the bit of the rumble and then added in some high mids to make it that little bit more snappy. So I'll do the usual trick of bypassing the EQ so you can hear what effect it's having but it is incredibly subtle. So that's just the first stage of mastering here, just kind of getting it to sit exactly where I want it and clean up a few of those frequencies that might be causing a few problems. The next thing I'm going into is a multiband compressor. Now some people really hate multiband compressors. I know Warren Hewitt from Produce Like a Pro really doesn't like them, but I absolutely love this one and it's great for just again enhancing the sound of the track. I'm only using it really subtly, I'm adding about half a dB of compression at most. But again, it, it, listen to the kick drum, it just helps the kick drum punch that little bit more. So the kick and the snare actually are sort of jumping out of the track a bit more and it's actually adding a bit more clarity in the hats as well, which is really nice. But again, it's super subtle. And carrying on with the super subtlety thing, we've got the Oxford Inflator. Now this is great for adding perceived volume to a track without compressing it. I don't quite know how it does it, but it does it really nicely. It's one of those plugins that's very easy to get carried away with and just keep dragging it up and up and making it sound fatter and fatter. But it sounds to me much better using it in a very subtle way in mastering. So I've just got it on at 12% here. But again, you can hear what effect it's having. It's very, very slight. So a little bit of extra added fatness, but really not much. Now from there, I've done two things in this mix that I've never tried before, but I think they've worked really well. I've got a duplicate of the track here with the Waves Abbey Road double tracker on it, which if I play it in solo, and if I turn this automation off up here, um, it won't sound too dissimilar from the actual mix. So slightly darker and crunchier, but it, doesn't really sound like an effect. But if I play it alongside with the original mix, you can hear it as a really crazy tape flanging effect. <laughs> 
So you would never print that on a mix like that because it's so over the top, but blended in subtly, it can have a really nice effect. It's great for mixing. I didn't actually use it in this mix, but I'm trying it in mastering and I really like how it works. And on top of that, I've also put a copy of the mix through the Roland Dimension D rack unit, which is really jangly and sounds like this. So the two of them together are very obvious kind of gimmicky effects, but used subtly, it can really enhance the width of a mix and just add a little bit of movement to it in a really nice way. So I've got a bit of automation on the ADT track here because in the kind of rock riff section, I want a more obvious tape flanging effect. So it's always in and it's just at a very subtle level, but I do drag it up. So if I play that section here, you'll see what I mean. So you can watch or listen to how that works here. So again, it's really subtle, but it's just adding a little bit of movement to that section, which I really like. Now from there, I've blended those two effects in over the main mix and then summed them together and they're coming out of Pro Tools into some analog outboard. So the two things I'm going through are the Warm Audio Pultec EQs and I'm not doing anything crazy again. I'm just adding a little bit of 100 Hertz in and a little bit of 10K, the so-called boom and fizz. And that just helps the low end thump and add a little bit more clarity up top. But I really like these EQs because they're tube EQ. So they do have a bit of character to them. They're not just kind of clean digital EQs, they are proper old school analog ones. And from there, I'm going into this Drama 1968 compressor, which is essentially a, a solid state FET compressor, but with a tube makeup gain on it. So you can drive the tubes and get some crunch going on. But I really like this compressor for two reasons. Firstly, there's a big switch here. So I can go from big and bigger on my low end response. And it's kind of like, um, like side chaining the compression almost. It stops those low frequencies making the compressor pump and lets them through. So it makes the low end much more thumpy, but also the overall compression much more natural. So I would say 90% of the kind of transient limiting that you're hearing in the final downloadable audio is being done by this unit. It does it in a really nice natural way. And it's much more sort of subtle and pleasing to listen to than using a brick wall limiter. So going from the three uh, channel channels in Pro Tools here out through the outboard and back into Pro Tools, you can hear what difference it's having. So the mix on its own with the effects just sounds like this. And then going from there, that this was then printed back into Pro Tools. And I'll try and match the levels a little bit, but you can hear just that subtle EQ and enhancement going on here. So a little bit more thump low down, we're getting that low end really dialed into where we want it now. And using the outboard EQs, those pull techs especially, they just sound so good for mastering. I love what they do. So back in Pro Tools here, we've got the print of our final mix. So the last thing we really want to do is we want to make it louder and a little bit wider. So I'm going back to the good old PSP Master Q and I'm adding some width on it here. Now this is generally more than I would usually add. I'm going to about 24% widening. I'd usually stick to about 15, but that works really nicely just throwing the, the, the sound out and making it sound much bigger in your headphones or on your monitors. And then I'm using it on this vintage limiter setting here. Now I mastered the whole of my last album using this as the limiter. It's a really nice sort of soft knee limiter and it sounds as as close as I've been able to find to a sort of old school analog hardware limiter. So this really isn't doing much at all, kind of one dB of compression at most really. Most of it has been done by the drama. But if you look down here, you can see what the effect the limiter is actually having and how much limiting is taking place. <laughs> So that's pretty much, give or take, I've dragged it down a little bit in Pro Tools here, how the final song is going to sound. But 
it's important at this stage to check a few different things. Firstly, check my mix against other mixers to check that the sort of quality and the EQ balance is all fair and good. And also just check the phase and check it in mono to check that it will work on a wide variety of sound systems. So I've got a few tools for that on my master fader here. The first one is this great plugin called Dynameter, which shows the dynamic range of the track. So I like to keep my mixes super dynamic. So if I put it up here, you can hear, you can see on this graph here, the dynamic range. Now eight is about as low as I would ever go. I generally try and stay a little bit above that. So we're sitting at sort of eight or nine on average. It does duck down to seven at the odd point, but I'm not too worried about that. If I play one of my reference songs here, which I'm not gonna play the audio because I'll probably get done for copyright infringement. But if I take Dynameter there and stick it on, say, Play Ball, which is an ACDC song, I will mute that here. But you can see on this Dynameter how limited that track is. So as you can see, it's kind of going down to six five it's really squashed it isn't much dynamic range in there but when you match the levels my song will kick much more it's got much more dam dynamic range and energy to it where the more you limit a song the more distorted it gets and it'll sound better at low volumes but when you turn it up it just sounds a bit flat compared to a, dy a dynamic mix so i always try and keep mine really dynamic so another thing, important thing to check is the mono compatibility. So I've got Panipulator here, which is, I think it might be free or very cheap. And it's got this great switch to flip it into mono. So I can do that just to check we're not getting any phase cancellation when listening in mono, because pretty much everyone will listen in stereo, but things such as iPhones have just a mono speaker. So it's important to check that nothing disappears. <laughs> So it does change the balance slightly, but the mix still works. We're not getting massive phase cancellation in the low end or anything like that. So that's spot on. And another important thing to check is the overall phase. Now you can generally tell if you're having phasing issues in your master session, but this little graph here will show that. So with a line straight up here, that means it's kind of pretty much perfectly in phase. But if I use Panipulator to throw the right channel out of phase, you can see it goes almost horizontal. So it sounds horrible when you do that, but it's important to check that the mix works. And even though your ears are telling you it's right, having these little sort of meters available are really, really good. So that is pretty much the mastering. That is it at full volume. We are peaking at minus 0.2. I don't like to go higher than that because it tends to distort when you encode it into MP3 and things like that. But that is pretty much the final master of the song. Now on the console over there, I forgot to say the mix is getting through the console on the way back into Pro Tools. I did a manual fade out at the end of the song over the sort of electric mistress clock noise that happens at the end. And as you can see down here, I've done two different edits. The video edit, which will be the audio for the final YouTube video. I did a manual fade out using the faders. On the audio edit, which will be the downloadable audio, I kind of faded out over the top of that because you don't want 15 seconds of noisy clock noise at the end of your um, MP3. So that is exactly, I mean, this is the final audio sat at the bottom here. This is what you're going to be able to download. This is what's going to be on the video. Dither down, which just helps it when reducing bitrate, because we've been at 32 bit 96 until now. We are now going down to the final quality of 16 bit, 44.1 for the audio and 48 for the video. So that is the mastering session. I've done a few little things like using the ADT, which um, hopefully is going to work and it seems to be working to now. But there's one important test we need to do now. Everything here on good monitors in the studio is telling me that this mix is done and it's sounding good. I've compared it to my reference tracks. The meters are showing me that it's all in phase and sounding good and I'm really happy with it. But one important test that can be really useful is listening to your mix on lots of different stereo systems to check that it translates. Now, 
One stereo system that we're pretty much all familiar with is that in our cars, because we all listen to loads of music while we're driving. So the so-called car test is a very important final stage in mastering a song, because if a mix sounds great on studio monitors, but a bit rubbish in the car, then it's not gonna work on various sound systems. So what I've done is I've taken that final master, burnt it to a CD, and now we're gonna go for a little drive just to check it on my car stereo, because my car stereo is terrible. So if this sounds good on there, it will sound good on anything. Okay, here we go. So there we are, it sounds good on my car speakers, so as far as I'm concerned it'll sound good on anything, because as I said my car stereo is absolutely terrible, but it wasn't flubbing out the speakers with the low end or anything, it just sounded really good compared to the other songs I was listening to side by side on other CDs in the car. So there we go guys, it's all done, the final audio is there. Now I'm going to edit the official video, or so called official video, to that and that is what's going to be going out on the 19th at 8 p.m. GMT. So hopefully by the time you see this video, there should be a premiere up on YouTube kind of waiting that you can RSVP to. So go on to that, click that you're attending. It would be great to have as many of you there at 8 p.m. on the 19th as we can. I think there's a live chat that I can use so you can send messages to me and I can reply in real time, which should be a lot of fun. So that's pretty much it, guys. The song is done, the video will be done, and um, yeah, there will be one more video just summing up what we've done here and talking about what went well, what could have gone better. But overall, I'm really happy with it and um, I really hope you guys are too. So thank you for following me on this video series, guys. It's been great having you coming along for the ride with me and I really hope that um, you like the final product when it's out on the 19th. So thank you guys, please do carry on writing with any questions you might have with hashtag AskPerky. I'll make as many videos as I can answering your questions and please do carry on subscribing to this channel. So I'll see you in one more video and then it's time for the big release, so make sure you check in for that. Thanks guys and I will see you soon, bye bye.